From Creation Ministries International, you're listening to Creation.com's article podcast. The research and insights that give God the glory, refutes evolution, and gives you the answers to defend your faith. I'm Joseph Darnell. Strange as this question might first appear, a logical consequence of old earth and theistic evolutionary viewpoints is that the world was rife with sinful thoughts and actions for hundreds of thousands of years of prehistory, long before the biblical Adam and Eve existed. The following is extracted from Evolution and the Christian Faith and explores this much overlooked subject. Over the years, much of the theological debate between historic special creationists and believers in a billions of years old earth has been over the issue of death. Was there death in the world before the fall? And if so, what kind of death was it? And to which creatures did it apply? These are important questions, but there is a related question that seems to be neglected almost completely. If, as many theistic evolutionists argue, human beings are descended from hominid ancestors, which, going backwards in time, were progressively less human, when do they envisage that sin itself entered the world? For the New Testament is unambiguous. Sin came into the world through the historical rebellion of Adam and Eve. Sin Before the Fall of Adam Written by Philip Bell Many theologians accept the prevailing cultural view that, for tens of thousands of years before Adam, whether envisaged as an actual man or a metaphorical figure, there were races of subhuman ancestors, hominids. Although lacking souls and spiritual awareness, these are believed to have been just like us in most other respects. All who hold an evolutionary worldview implicitly believe that such hominids were committing the full range of acts which, today, we moral human beings acknowledge to be sinful. Lust, rape, covetousness, theft, murder, and much more. Unlike creationist anthropologists, who believe that most of the fossils assigned to the genus Homo are descendants of Adam, theistic evolutionists teach that there is a spiritual discontinuity between Homo sapiens and all the species that preceded it. Thus, Homo ergaster, Homo erectus, Homo heidelbergensis, Homo antecessor, Homo neanderthalensis, and Homo florensis, to name just some of the common alleged ancestors or ancient relatives of man, were all soulless. That is to say, they lacked the moral and spiritual capacities with which people are endowed today. On the other hand, the majority of anthropologists who hold to the historical, special creation viewpoint regard those species of genus Homo as fully human descendants of Adam. This is based on comparisons of their bony anatomy and even comparisons of DNA sequences in some cases. Within a theistic evolutionary framework, and many other Old Earth views too, for example progressive creationism and gap theory, all members of Homo sapiens, our own species, who were alive prior to the point when God made them like himself, were also soulless. True humanity only ensued when God conferred his image and likeness upon chosen members of the species. After God breathed into these select proto-people, souls were imparted to them. They became Homo divinus. That being so, at what point in the fossil record do theistic evolutionists look for Adam? Their opinions are inevitably arbitrary and contrary to the biblical teaching of the image of God. Disbelieving in a historical Adam, Dennis Lamoureux writes, A landmark issue of Christianity Today in June 2011 featured a cover with a Neanderthal-looking male and female and the title, The Search for the Historical Adam. This Christianity Today article is evidence that the historicity of Adam is not a settled issue. With this example, it is legitimate to ask whether, according to theistic evolutionists, Neanderthals were sinners. Some might come back with the answer, of course not, they were just animals. Animals are not morally culpable as humans are. What then are we to make of the fact that the genome, the DNA code of Neanderthals, is like our own? 
And what about the considerable evidence that the people with classical Neanderthal features, for example, a more robust skeleton, a prominent brow ridges, a more forward projecting midface, and a bony protuberance like a hair knot at the back of the head, interbred with people just like ourselves? In other words, the evidence shows that people with Neanderthal morphology and so-called modern humans, who generally lack those Neanderthal features, intermarried. Does not the concept of bipedal human ancestors of Adam committing incest, rape, murder, and cannibalism sit rather uncomfortably? They looked very little different from us and were reproductively compatible with modern people. It makes perfect sense that such things followed the fall. However, within a theistic evolutionary model, our soulless ancestors were supposedly doing these things for hundreds of thousands of years in God's very good world. See Genesis 131. Staying with Neanderthal man, decades ago, a growing realization that he was much more human than had been believed led two writers to comment that, if he could be reincarnated and placed in a New York subway, provided that he were bathed, shaved, and dressed in modern clothing, it is doubtful whether he would attract any more attention than some of the other denizens. If it was from this Neanderthal stock, or some related stock, that God brought us forth, it would indicate that we are of the same kind biologically. Now, scripture teaches that men are of a different flesh, or are different in kind, from various sorts of animals, in 1 Corinthians 15.39. Yet according to theistic evolution, ancestors who very much appear to be our kind, on the basis of both fossil and DNA evidence, were without souls. Presumably, the argument would be that they were not culpable for the gross and horrible acts that we consider morally reprehensible today. Scripture is clear that sin of various sorts actually pollutes the land from God's point of view. Examples include sexual promiscuity, adultery, idolatry, bloodshed, and child sacrifice. Yet, if we imagine going back in time as spectators and viewing our primitive ancestors in this hypothetically less evolved world, we would observe all these things and more in their all actions which the Bible teaches are sinful and evil. What we're getting at is that, in God's very good creation, such things would have been a defilement of the land. Referring to sexual immorality and all impurity or covetousness and idolatry, Paul says, because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. God hates idolatry, robbery, falsehood, even evil thoughts and plans. These attitudes and actions are not merely sin when morally culpable human beings commit them. They are intrinsically wrong, things which God hates. The brutality that we observe in animals today can be at once fascinating and macabre. Of course, pre-fall animal death poses questions of its own. When a troop of normally vegetarian chimpanzees catch and tear apart a colobus monkey, or a male lion kills a lioness's cubs, these are aberrations. As such, they would not have been occurring before the fall. While not morally culpable creatures, animals can still commit acts which make them defiled. Under the Mosaic Law, a person convicted of bestiality was put to death, but so was the animal. Both were deemed guilty of an abominable act. Leviticus 20.16 They shall surely be put to death, their blood is upon them. Also, if an ox gored a person to death, it was itself to be killed. Exodus 21, 28 and 31 through 32. Animals were held culpable of such things under the Mosaic law. In our own societies today, it is normal for a dog that has viciously maimed or killed someone to be put down. Obviously, we would not believe that animals possess a sense of good and evil. Nevertheless, euthanasia in such instances is seen as a sensible measure to prevent further harm to people by an animal that has proven dangerous. For some people at least, it is also the right thing to do, especially as animals are not people. It seems reasonable that animals which have caused great disfigurement or have deprived people of life should forfeit the right to continued life themselves. 
Therefore, even our primitive human ancestors are deemed to have been soulless animals. Their loathsome and gross acts are incompatible with the goodness and holiness of the Creator God. Actually, there is irrefutable evidence that human ancestors of the genus Homo, allegedly soulless ones, according to advocates of theistic evolution, were spiritually aware beings that had a concept of an afterlife. For instance, numerous deliberate burials of Neanderthals have been documented at sites across Europe and Western Asia. One was even buried with flowers. There is good evidence that they made jewelry, cooked with herbs, played musical instruments, cared for their disabled, and much more. Neanderthals have also been found buried alongside anatomically modern humans. And since an appreciation of morality goes hand in hand with spiritual perception, it would be futile to argue that Neanderthals were not culpable for what we recognize as sinful acts. Yet, by holding to theistic evolution, actions which God hates, brutality, theft, deliberate deception, incest, rape, murder, and much more, would have gone on for hundreds of thousands of years before Adam. And during the last tens of millennia, these things would have been performed by people who looked just like us. Evangelical theologian Wayne Grudem concurs. He highlights the following key tenet of theistic evolution, which he believes conflicts with biblical teaching as follows. Adam and Eve did not commit the first human sins, for human beings were doing morally evil things before Adam and Eve. Does not the very proposition, spelled out in this manner, sound ridiculous? More seriously, if God really did set up the world in this way, it sends out a very confusing message regarding His disposition towards sin. Within the teaching of theistic evolution, God's entire stance regarding sin would seem to have arbitrarily altered when He created Adam. It's no wonder that the doctrine of sin in contemporary theology is far less prominent than it used to be. This is far from being merely a point of theoretical interest. Today, many people are rejecting traditional Christian moral and ethical standards precisely because they have embraced an evolutionary philosophy. If we are evolved animals, and we were not specially created as the Bible teaches, what justifiable reason can be given for arguing that certain things are sinful, or that there should be any restraints on our behavior? Evolution's Achilles Heels is a powerful book and documentary that exposes the fatal flaws of evolutionary thinking. Like no other work that we are aware of, it is authored by nine PhD scientists to produce a coordinated, coherent, powerful argument. Testing the most basic fields in the evolutionary theory, such as natural selection and the origin of life, scientists expose devastating weaknesses. All the authors received their doctorates from similar secular universities as their evolutionist counterparts. Each is a specialist in a field relevant to the subject written about, natural selection, origin of life, geology, genetics, radiometric dating, the fossil record, cosmology, and ethics. The documentary film and book directly demolish the very pillars of the belief system that underpins our now secular culture, evolutionary naturalism. It's coupled with the biblical command to reach the lost with the Bible's good news. In a nutshell, it's a comprehensive outreach tool like no other. Get your copy of Evolution's Achilles Heels at creation.com slash store. For everyone at creation.com, thank you for listening.